I continue at line 96? Yeah, so, so you said rightly, if, you know, we call this, this CFG thing is what we get from calling command factory dot config, isn't it? So we presumably succeeded in reading the configuration, whatever it is, whatever it is, is inside that CFG somehow. And maybe get is a way of getting it. So we could imagine this is some sort of little key value store, couldn't we? So we could say, um, get me something out of that config. Don't know what that empty string is, but the other string is prompt. So we, that sounds like a config setting that there could be, doesn't it? And we we get that value, whatever it is, plus some error which we ignore. And then we're saying its value could be the string disabled, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And if it is, what do we do then? Um, if it is, we Let's see. So is set never prompt to true, and that's on command factory dot io streams. Yeah. So again, this CMD factory io streams thing, which is apparently related to terminal control presentation output mode, something like that, isn't it? So there's some there's some prompt config setting which can be enabled or disabled, I guess. If it's disabled, we call this method set never prompt true. <laughs> Sounds a bit backward, doesn't it? It's like, don't do what yeah. Donnie don't does. Um, it, it should be set. You can imagine it's just set prompt false. <laughs> that, that would make more sense to me, but instead it's set don't prompt to be true. Okay, fine. Don't prompt. All right, what's next? Um, and then they kind of do the same thing again, but for a, a variable pager. Yep. And if pager does not is not blank, is not blank string, we set pager to pager. Right. Does, kind of a similar. Does the word pager mean anything to you? Is it you know like a paginator, like pages in the Yeah, I think so. How many pages there are? Yeah, and this um if you know how if you run some command, you, you can get screens and screens and screens of output. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's difficult to read and you have to scroll back or whatever, but you could pipe it into something like less or or more, but most likely less, um, which would show you one screen at a time and you can sort of hit any key to go to the next page, isn't it? Or even go back and forth. So I'm, I'm guessing, or perhaps we could guess, that's what this is about. If... Um, you know, the gh command could produce tons of output. So maybe if you configure some pager, it's saying if there's more than a screen's worth, it'll go to less or whatever. Fine. So this seems reasonable, doesn't it? It's like we read the config and now we're saying, let's look at that config and change some settings based on it. Fine. What's next? On line 103, there's a comment that says, is to do. Yeah, and it, and it hasn't been done. <laughs> and it hasn't been done in this doing. I don't know if that's a to-do that they need to fix. Huh? This is the fate of all to-do comments, isn't it? They'll just <laughs> sit there forever, not being done. Um, because, you know, as as a working programmer, I don't know if, if that is your job, um, but for those, you know, who, who for full-time devs, when you come into work and you, you sit down or, or you stay at home to work, and the first thing you do is you probably have some work tracking or project management system, isn't it, which tells you what your current task is and you you work from that. What you never do is you never say, I have no tasks to do today. So what I'm going to do is look through my code base <laughs> for any comment that says to do, and then I'll do whatever that says. Literally nobody has ever done that, which is why these things don't happen. So I don't don't do that. <laughs> but it's so tempting, isn't it? When you, as you're writing the code, you're thinking, "Ooh, I know I need to do this, but I don't have time right now, or I can't be bothered or something." So I'll just make a note to myself. And it's not oh. important. If it were important, it would go into Jira, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Or, or whatever tracking system we have. It's like, oh, this is really important. You know, the product explodes if incorrectly plugged in. Fine, that's actually a task we need to track. But if it's unimportant, we might just make a comment saying, remember to do this. Um, 
And I'm sure I'm being grossly unfair, and I'm sure they're really disciplined programmers who definitely do this, and they, they diligently grep their code base for to do. Um, you could even imagine a CI step, couldn't you, which just says, hey, if there's any to do comments, you're not releasing that <laughs> product <laughs> because apparently you missed some stuff. I literally have this with my books. Like, you know, I write Go books using Markdown and um, Pandoc toolchain to turn these into epubs and pdfs and things and i actually have a step that says grep to do <laughs> star.md if there is one don't you know don't ship the book because it means there's something missing this is a good idea yeah yeah and it annoys me every day because i want to just quickly produce the pdf to look at it you know but i can't do it because i've got all these to do's in so i just think fine okay i'm gonna have to actually do all of these tasks before getting on to the next fun bit but it's yeah. safe to do it something to think about. Um, so fine, yeah, sorry, Erin, I interrupted you there. Carry on. Oh, yeah, I, I wasn't, I, that was a good side comment because I wasn't sure if it was a to-do in the sense that they need to do something about this code or if it was like a comment that something is going to happen later. Right, yeah, um, I assume it's the former. Yeah, I, I just wasn't sure as I was reading. Um, so then there's another if statement. Um, post an error. This time we do want to know about the error. Yeah, it's another of these compound if statements, isn't it? And it's cfg.default host. And we're saying if error is nil. So if there's no error that's returned from that. Um, gh repo. So we're setting a default host to host. Yeah, what do you think that would be? Is that like the API server? Yeah, I'm thinking, yeah, maybe. Be, like you could imagine if, um, you know, there is the, the github.com that we all know and love, of course, but there is also sort of enterprise GitHub, you know, per, per customer, you get your own personal GitHub, don't you? Um, and Presumably, if you were to use the GH tool with that, you would need to configure it to say, hey, don't use the public GitHub, use this one. Maybe it's that? I don't know. I'm just shouting theories here, <laughs> but <laughs> we can guess, can't we? So that's very good. Okay, what's next? Um, and then we're creating a variable expanded args. That's a uh string slice yep um, an empty one yeah this is yeah. an example of what we were saying earlier isn't it where we talked about make and we said mm -hmm. with with slices you you can use make and but you don't have to because you could just assign some empty slice value or even a slice that has things in you know um, but in this case it's empty so that's absolutely right um and so we're seeing if the length of OS args, so if there's at least one, if it's greater than zero. Yep, which we know there always will be. Which it is, yep. Then expanded args equals OS args one through, oh, so it's putting all of the arguments into that. Yeah, have, that you, see, have you seen this syntax before? I haven't really. So this is, I, I call this a, a slice index expression. I'm not sure if that's the correct term. Um, but what it means is, you know, if, if you had some slice, OS args, let's say, you, you can get some specific element of it by putting the index number in square brackets, can't you? Like you can say, yep. OS args brackets zero, give me the first element. And you can also do that with more than one element. You can say, um, give me elements X through Y. You know, um, or in this case, element one, which is the second element, through to the end, because uh, there's no number after the colon, so it just means up until the end. But if there were a number there, that would be the index number of the first element that you don't want. A through and two. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit confusing, isn't it? So we use one, a... two, whatever. So yeah, so one colon two would be unnecessary because it would just be element one. Mm -hmm. Um, if you said one colon three, that would be elements one and two, but not three, isn't it? And so forth. Mm -hmm. 
It's a bit weird. I think maybe the more intuitive one would be the second one is the is the index of the last element you want, isn't it? But it doesn't work that way. It's the index of the first element that you don't want. Mm -hmm. So there it is. Just one of these crazy things about Go that you just have to accept, or or switch to Rust, you know. But don't do that. <laughs> um, yeah. So we're putting then. I guess it would be everything besides that first argument. That's the GH. Yeah. Would be put into that um, string slice. Yeah, I think what they really mean is if len of OS args is greater than one, isn't it? Yeah. We know it'll always be at least one. Apparently they don't. Um, and if there, you know, if, so what we're really saying is if there are extra arguments other than the program name, put them in this slice. Assuming so they can use them later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So great. Okay, Jakob, would you like to read the next bit? Yeah. We're going to do something with those expanded arcs, aren't we? Yeah, so we are passing these expanded arcs to some function traverse. And from this function, we are returning as well some command CMD, I believe, omitting again some returned value. Yeah, apparently not the error this time, because we are actually receiving yeah. the error. We're ignoring yeah. something else. Yeah, and we are getting errors, and then we are checking the line. Of course, if error is not nil, or... Or, oh, that's right. Uh, our CMD is the root CMD. Okay, so if this uh, entire expression is evaluated to true, then we are starting the, the online 115. So we are assigning the original arcs, the value of the expanded arcs, then setting is shell to false. Then we have some function expanded alias. This is a bit passing, confusing, isn't it? Yeah, passing CFG, which is some config object, I believe. Do we think uh, this is something like, you know, if we have some of those extra subcommands which we talked about earlier, is this about trying to detect from the argument list? Do we have any of those subcommands, or or which one is it? You know, is it gh clone or whatever? Um, and mm -hmm. I, I'm guessing that's what root cmd dot traverse does. And if it returns some error. That means, I guess, there aren't any subcommands. Or if CMD, so it returns CMD, and if that is the same as the root command, then that I guess that has the same meaning, doesn't it? There's no subcommands because the only command I could find yeah. was this one, <laughs> the one we're already in. So if that's the case, so um, if that's the case, we are basically this. What is this extend alias? So. We need to, okay, we are passing some configuration, I believe it is the CFG. Yeah. Then we are passing the slice of these arguments, arcs, OS arcs. So this is all arguments that we received from command line at the very beginning. And some third argument, which is nil, basically. Yeah, what do we think alias means here? Any guesses? I mean, we definitely wouldn't be expected to know this. <laughs> but supply our deductive skill. So uh, I, I would guess this is something like, you know, if if you're bored with typing long git commands, like I see people do this, you know, they oh, alias yes, git checkout yes, to I GCO see, see or something like mean. that. Yes, yes. Um, we, we might guess that it's something like that, mightn't we? And uh, apparently that could error. Mm -hmm. So if, if you have bogus aliases, which you know, don't actually alias to anything. I guess we we print out that error. What's yeah, next? so just in case we are returning this exit error if if we get an error returned from this expand alias function. Mm -hmm. mm, okay, then we are checking if we set the debug. So if our the variable has debug is true, then we are okay, and then we are basically 
reading to standard error more detailed i would say information here so we are setting up the pattern here as a second parameter to f print which will be the basically the value of original arcs mm -hmm. with this uh, arrow yeah there's a lot to font isn't there as, as, as we've discovered on previous code clubs like it does a lot um and it's a super, super useful thing to know about. In fact, you could say, you know, there's sort of regular old font.printer then, um, which just prints things. Um, but the, the much more interesting version is printf, isn't it? Which takes some mm -hmm. format string and it says, I'm not just going to give you some data. I'm going to also tell you how to format it. And that's almost like a mini language. Yeah. It is It is a little programming language within Go, isn't it? Um, and it consists of these sort of percent things i call them placeholders or i think they're officially called verbs that's slightly confusing um and it's basically um you know anything which is not a percent thing i just want you to literally print that isn't it you know if yeah. i give you if you give you the format string hello it just prints hello but if i said hello percent v that means print hello and then here's a placeholder for some data which i'm going to give you uh, original args and expanded args in this case and there's also some special escape sequences with a backslash but the usual one is backslash n isn't it for new line yeah that's the so one we mostly create use create the new line yeah so we're saying um please fumped print to standard error um some value i'm going to tell you followed by space followed by right pointing arrow followed by space followed by some other value followed by new line and here's the data i mentioned earlier um so it looks like it's oh, we have some args you know let's try and expand them to see if any of them are valid aliases um if we're in debug mode so we established that's what that has debug does then mm -hmm. just log effectively to say hey i did some expansion you know, here's what I started with, here's what I expanded it into. So if you're finding, you know, it's not detecting your alias or expanding it to the wrong thing or something, you say, let's turn on debug mode and see what it's actually doing. Um, if if it was our own program, we would probably just stick print statements in, wouldn't we? To just see what's going on. That's very useful. So excellent. All right, Anusha, would you like to do another bit? Yeah. If is shell, I think if shell is from you. Yeah. yeah, apparently that comes from expand alias, doesn't it? Exe er colon equals essay save exec dot look path expanded args of zero. Okay. What's all that about? <laughs> I have no idea. But this, this is sort of okay, isn't it? I mean, you, you could imagine people who kind of, um, they might try to read Go code, especially if they're learning, they might just say, let's have a look at some people's programs. So they might see something like this and just say, well, I don't understand this, you know. Clearly that's my fault because I'm just dumb or don't, don't know enough or whatever. But in fact, you know, that's completely normal. Everybody that looks at this would just be like, well, I don't know what that does. Um, Again, maybe we can find out or guess, but I guess what I'm saying is it's sort of, it's okay to be completely in the dark, isn't it? Yeah, on the other hand, it teaches us to use meaningful names in our own codes. Because yeah, someone think, else will be reading, but we will come back after a while. Yeah, I think that's right. And, mm. and, and this code, while clearly it works, you know, and it does the job for GitHub and I'm not criticizing it in any way. Um, but nonetheless, it could be clearer, couldn't it? As, as we've discovered, um, there, there are ways to refactor this or just to write it in a clearer way. And I, I think whoever wrote this, it's not that they couldn't do that. It's probably just that they weren't trying. You know, that wasn't the primary goal in their mind is they wasn't thinking, I, I bet when the Code Club panel look at this program, you know, they'll be able to understand it. They were just trying to get done what they needed to get done, weren't they? You know, I have some bug to fix or some 
some feature to implement or whatever and they kind of do this first pass where it's like get the program working and then there should really be some second pass shouldn't there where you go through it and you say now that i know what the program does can i express that a little more clearly i think that's one really nice thing about doing code club is it sort of reminds us about that isn't it and then when we're writing some go program we could just think in the back of our minds, okay, what happens when this program is on Code Club? What will they be saying about it? <laughs> you know, and, so. and it really it really teaches a lot because right now my colleagues know that I will bother them. Right. <laughs> that I don't understand what they meant writing code. Yeah. Exactly. So sorry Anusha, I interrupted you again and digressed again, but that's that's partly why we're here, isn't it? But Please continue. So there's some, there's, some, there's some is shell variable, isn't there? Which do we know what that means? I think that's that came from expand alias, didn't it? So is that saying is is there actually some shell that gh runs? Like if you just run gh with no arguments, you get dropped into a little shell where you can type gh commands. That, that sounds like a reasonable guess, doesn't it? So it sounds like that's the mode we're in if this if statement is true. So there's some safe exec look path um, that in fact it's saying failed to run external command, isn't it? So that sort of implies um, that if this is not some internal gh command, it's just you know, run some other command, some Unix command, um, that might not work. <laughs> and apparently that's that's what this is doing, is it's saying, hey, do a look path, maybe look in the user's path to say, does that command exist somewhere? If not, clearly we can't run it. So error. But if it is okay, what happens? So at line external, 135, yeah. External cmd colon equals exec dot command uh, function call exe yeah. expanded args uh, one and just. Yeah, more confusing syntax here, isn't it? Lots of square brackets and colons and dots. What do any of these things do? <laughs> Can we unpack this? What's does allow what's, for any number of arguments, right? Yeah, well, what's exec.command for a start? Anyone know? This is part of the standard library, in fact. So if you wanted to run some external command from your program, you can totally do that. So exec.command is a good way to do it. And what you give it is you give it the path to the command you want to run. That's, that's what we just found out. I'm calling look path, I guess. And then you also give it a slice of arguments. So actually a, a number of variadic arguments. Um, let me clarify what I mean by variadic, because that's a wonderful $10 word, isn't it? We should try and use this in conversation today. So there are, we, we've seen functions where, you know, they list the parameters they take in, in the func signature. That's fine. But what about functions which can take variable numbers of parameters. Like Fumped println is one of these, isn't it? You can give it any number of things and it just happily prints them. So how does that work? Is it, it's, it's called a variadic function, which just means it can vary the number of parameters it takes. And um, the way you write that is in the function signature, instead of saying x int or whatever, you say x dot 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 int, meaning you know, potentially lots of ints or none. Um, and what happens is inside that function, you know, if, if somebody gives you a bunch of ints, you will effectively get them as a slice. So x will be a slice, you can index it the usual way. And um, if you want to call one of those functions, and if you have a slice, what do you do? because it doesn't take 
a slice, it takes just a variable number of things, right? So you need to sort of do the opposite operation. That dot, dot, dot that comes before the type name says, expect multiple things and make a slice out of them. This is the opposite. It says, given a slice, make multiple things out of it. You know, so when you say some slice name, dot, 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 you're saying, get me all the elements in that slice and then supply each of them as a separate argument to this function. I'm not sure if that's a brilliantly clear explanation, but it's the best I can come up with. Um, so that's one part of it, isn't it? So we have expanded args. Um, this is a version of the original command line arguments with aliases expanded. And then comes one of those slice index expressions, doesn't it? So now that, now that we know how those work, we can work out which elements of expanded args we're going to get, can't we? All of them starting at index one? Yeah, exactly. So all but the first, I suppose, is another way of saying that. And then we unroll them. That's what I call this dot, dot, dot operation is basically turn that slice into just a bunch of values. Um, because it happens, that's what exec.command takes. You could have said maybe it makes more, make more sense for exec.command to take a slice, right? <laughs> um, that's not That's not wrong, but it's just not the way it works. So, okay, brilliant. So we, we unpacked that a bit, didn't we? So what happens next? External cmd dot standard error is OS dot standard error. Yeah, we mentioned Ext that before, didn't we? Yeah. External command dot uh, std out standard out is equal to OS dot standard output. External command dot standard and is equal to OS dot standard input. Mm -hmm. So do you know what this is doing? Or can you guess? So the command that we will be executing, we are setting the standard, like whatever will be the output. So correspondingly, it will be displayed on the corresponding standard error output or input. Yeah, exactly right. Couldn't have put it better myself. these OS dot standard out and standard error and so forth are just predefined to say, you know, if you, so we're effectively saying when you run this command, which we haven't done yet, but get ready to run it, you know, here's the command, here's the arguments, here's where the error output should go, here's where the normal output should go, here's where you should get your input from, and then, well, we don't, we don't run it next, do we, but we do something. What's this line 139? Prepare cmd colon equals run dot prepare cmd and uh, function call argument is external cmd. Yeah, I don't know what that's about, but some kind of preparing, isn't it? It's like, here's the command, prepare to run it, you know, in some way. We can probably ignore whatever that is. And then the next bit must be actually running it, isn't it? PRR equals prepared cmd dot run function call. Yep. So we call run on it, which runs it, as you might well have guessed, and that returns some error. And then what do we do with the error? If error not equals null, if ee comma ok colon equals error dot Function for pointer to exec dot exit error. And yeah, this is another of these compound if statements, isn't it? So it's like if do stuff, semicolon, then check something. So we have something here. Anybody seen this syntax before? Error dot something in parentheses. Checking type of the error, right? Yeah, that's right. You might well have guessed that it's a function call because it looks exactly like one, but it's not because it's actually a type assertion. It's it's saying, you know, error is some value. I don't know what type it is. Um, is it a pointer to exec dot exit error? That's what this syntax will do is it's it will give you two values 
Um, if it turns out that the type assertion is true, that it is that type, then it will give you the value as that type. So EE is error converted into an exit error, if that's what it is. And OK tells you whether or not that was the case. You know, it might not be an exit error. It might be something else, in which case OK will be false. And that's what we check, isn't it? We say, please look at this error value. Is it the type pointed to exec.exit error? If it is, then do the thing inside the curly braces. Which is returning some exit code based on that, isn't it? It's like, so, so to summarize, you can say having, having set up this external command, set its input and output streams, prepared it, whatever that means, run it, We've got an error from run. And clearly, one thing that can be is it can be that the program itself exited with error status, isn't it? So we might have successfully run that program, but the program itself reports, hey, something went wrong. In which case, we can say, you know, or, or alternatively, we might not be able to successfully run it, isn't it? Maybe we don't have permission, or it's an invalid binary format, or you know, literally any other kind of problem. In that case, we just log it and exit saying fail to run the external command. But if it's not one of those, if it's, you know, this error that says I successfully ran it, but it returned non-zero exit status, then we say, okay, give me that status <laughs> and I will then return some exit code. I'll, this looks like a function call at line 144, return exit code brackets ee.exit code, isn't it? But it's actually a type conversion. So, you, you know, if you can convert one type into another in Go, then the way you do it is by saying type name that I want brackets the value that I have. Um, so we're saying ee.exit code returns something we can guess int, can't we? That sounds reasonable, like could be zero, for example. Um, and But but what we return is our own type called exit code, which is actually just int, isn't it? That was virtually the very first thing we saw that Aaron saw was defining the exit code type to be int. So we couldn't just return an int because that would be a type mismatch. We have to say, we have some int, please turn it into an exit code and then return it. So that's great. Um, we're kind of at the end of our time and I don't want to take up too much of your valuable Friday. So I wonder how much of this did we get through? So like from the from the scroll bar, it looks like we're about halfway through main. Is that about right? Yes. There's a fair bit more to this, isn't there? Any guesses as to what percentage of the entire program we've seen? Maybe. <laughs> Probably not a very large one, right? There's a lot more stuff preparation, here. yeah. Yeah, and just skimming through what we didn't get to, which is welcome to GitHub CLI. You know, we didn't get as far as the welcome message, <laughs> but actually there was a lot of machinery there, wasn't there? And mm -hmm. some interesting pieces of syntax in Go and other features of Go or patterns and things which are quite interesting. And, and I... I find, you know, it's always interesting to me, whatever random bit of code we look at. And even if it turns out to be not much to do with the main things, there's always something interesting we can find about it or something useful to talk about. Because I can imagine we could look at some function where it's like, we just look at it and completely understand everything that it's doing. But the people watching might not understand it. In which case, we would have done them a disservice by just saying, yeah, that's obvious, it's trivial, you know, move on. Nothing is obvious, nothing is trivial. Um, it's all worth exploring. So I think with that in mind, shall we wrap up this afternoon's fun? Thank you to my guests, Jakob and Erin and Anusha. Thanks very much for being here. It's nice to have you. Thanks for having me. And... Okay. To those at home, thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you on the next Code Club.